dive in and get started. Uh, welcome to those who are, are joining us. Hopefully you're at home as well or in your office kitchen. You can pull up a uh, cup of chai or coffee uh, since we're in Western Canada. Uh, welcome Steve, Dr. Stephen Nagy, a old dear friend of the Canada West Foundation, someone who's helped us immensely with our, with our research and a go-to source for us um, on events on the other side of the Pacific. Sharon Sun, our trade economist, I think I called her senior trade economist in another talk we did this morning, uh, is here with us as well. So what we're doing today is inviting you to pull up a chair, literally and figuratively, and join us in the conversation. We thought we'd share something else that we do here at Canada West. When we have friends or visitors uh, in town from, from outside, they drop in and we pull up chairs, literally in the kitchen, and we'll have the entire staff of Canada West sitting around uh, talking with our guests. So we thought we'd like to share that with the, uh, the wider Canada West family, uh, our supporters, and, and those who follow us. Today's conversation is a very open-ended, as the sort of gather around the kitchen table conversation is, an open-ended conversation about Western Canadian interests, and the changing uh, political, but mostly because this is Canada West, mostly the economic and trade concerns um, for Western Canada around the Pacific Rim, or as Stephen likes to call it, the end of Pacific. And hopefully he'll be able to give us uh, uh, an inkling on that, on that term. So what we'll do is we'll invite Stephen to offer some comments uh, about what's appearing on the front things uh, on the Asian, uh, the Pacific Rim, the Indo-Pacific front, things that maybe we weren't paying too much attention to, but now that the hostages ha have been released and are back, um, we have the space and the time um, or the necessity uh, as other things begin to emerge back on the agenda and emerge back into public attention. So we'll let Stephen give us his thoughts as to what's happening. If he were here, we'd say, so Stephen, what do you think we should be paying attention to? And then Sharon and I will have a conversation with them. We welcome uh, questions from the audience uh, to go to Stephen as well. But with that, um, Professor, Doctor, turn it over to you. Thanks, Carlo. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Gary, for welcoming me today. And thanks to the Canadian West Foundation. I always feel like I'm at home when I visit. So it's really wonderful to be able to come and speak in this forum. I, I'd really like to focus on just a five minute commentary. And after that, I'd prefer to open up the floor to Q&A so that our audience members can uh, engage in the dialogue that I think is really important. So the three, I guess, ideas that I'd like to really focus on is this idea of Indo-Pacific, what it means for Canadian businesses and the, um, in, in Western Canada, but Canada broadly. Second, the China paradox, which I think is really important for us to understand. Um, and third, um, this idea of uh, engaging in the Indo-Pacific and re-engaging in China. And I think this is a really, really important um, point in my discussion. So in terms of the Indo-Pacific, why are we using this term? Um, does it replace the Atlantic uh, relationship? Does it replace this Asia-Pacific idea or um, Pacific Rim as, as Carlos mentioned? No, not at all. Uh, these are complementary uh, ideas. Uh, and when we're talking about this so-called Indo-Pacific region, what we're really focusing on is from North and um, South uh, America, all the way to the West side of the Indian Ocean. And we're really thinking about how to build uh, sustainable, long-lasting, transparent rules-based institutions in a region that's not very institutionalized. And I think that's a real key point. Uh, when we think about um, the Asia Pacific, we have APEC. We have many forums in which we are engaging in. Asia, a APEC, you're gonna have to APEC, uh, um, help us out uh, with the acronyms here. Asia Pacific uh, Economic Community. So this is a forum for uh, building shared regulations, um, shared uh, ideas about trade and what we see in the Asia Pacific is that there's already many pre-existing institutions that I think are really important for shaping trade, shaping shared regulations, 
Uh, and that's an important way to um, distinguish the Indo-Pacific region and the Asia Pacific is that we don't really have uh, uh, institutions that represent the broader Indo-Pacific. So this is what I mean by institutions. And I think this is why I think Canada should be at the table. And there's a very good expression. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think that Canada should be part of shaping the rules and regulations of the Indo-Pacific so we can promote trade uh, and Canadian interests um, in the broader Indo-Pacific region. My second point was the China paradox. I think as most of us know, um, Canadian and China relations are really at their lowest level in the post-normalization period. But when we look at trade, and Canada West has some really great publications about Canadian trade with China, we see that trade's up about 33% over the past two years. And Canada doesn't just share this China paradox. Japan, Australia, um, South Korea, New Zealand, um, the United States, despite record lows in the uh, favorability of China, our trade footprint continues to increase. And our various um, chambers of commerce um, continue to want to be engaged in the China market. But at the same time, they want to have fair, uh, 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 a market that is transparent, rules-based, and really is, is, is the market driving um, competition rather than state-owned enterprises and protective policies. So the China paradox is my second key point, and I think we'll probably come back to this. My third point was this idea of Canada engaging in an uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that focuses on institution building and building trade partners um, and re-engaging with China at the same time. And the reason why I say this is important, I think that Canada needs a broader uh, Indo-Pacific strategy to engage and build those institutions such that we can benefit from trade, we can shape the digital economy rules, we can shape um, AI rules, we can shape quantum computing rules, and we can shape um, how agriculture and other forms of trade are engaged in the region. At the same time, I think that if we roll out an Indo-Pacific strategy, while not re-engaging China, that it will appear as a containment strategy or a geopolitical strategy. And I don't think this is in Canadian interest. Um, as I mentioned in the China paradox comment that Canada and Western Canada benefits from its bilateral trade relationship with China. But at the same time, we're very much interested in ensuring that um, trade throughout the region um, is rules-based and transparent and done through strong institutions that uh, protect Canadian interests that allow for Canadians to trade within the region and benefit from the enormous growth within the region, but at the same time um, really uh, allows us to have broader dynamic relations with uh, like-minded countries like Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and many others, which I think should be a springboard for uh, engagement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities of the Chinese market, but also learning from their experiences of how to deal with the more challenging geopolitical and geoeconomic issues within the region. So I'll stop there. I promised five minutes and I think Carla will probably throw some questions on the table. And I really do encourage everyone to ask the questions they would like to, to ask. Well, thanks for that, Stephen. And uh, I, I, I really should ask Sharon if I can go ahead and start, uh, but that's the way things work around here. <laughs> uh, if so let's start with the Indo-Pacific. You mentioned that the terms, and you know, you and I have gone back and, and forth, you know, my, 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 my take on a new term coming into the table, but could you really break it down for us? If I'm a, a business person or an exporter, I'm used to Asia Pacific. Maybe I have a rough idea what that means. At Canada West, I use Pacific Rim to model the TPP. So you think about a rim, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Canada, maybe the US, Japan, you can actually kind of see when you see, when I talk about the rim, you can actually kind of in your mind play out the countries. With the Indo Pacific, I hear Indo, so I'm thinking India, and I hear Pacific, so I'm thinking Samoa uh, or Hawaii. So help me out here with a physical, uh, a physical description of what we're talking about. So that's a really great way to think about it, Carlo. And if we think about when APEC, the Association of Pacific Economic Community was uh, founded back in the early 90s, South Asia, including Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, really wasn't on the radar in terms of trade. Um, it wasn't on the radar in terms of uh, a growing middle-class um, 
group of citizens that could consume uh, Canadian products, uh, whether that's beef or milk, or um, we're thinking about our, the various grains that we have. Um, but today, the um, South Asia, so India and Sri Lanka, they have a burgeoning middle class that's interested in consuming our products. Um, their economy is much more significant uh, in terms of their global economic footprint. And that's really, really important. And when we're thinking about using this Indo-Pacific idea, it's a recognition that this part of the world has really come online. We have an enormous middle class that we could tap in terms of trade and in terms of um, thinking about how we can engage those consumers there. Um, but also uh, recognizing them as being an important part of the rules forming uh, institutions moving forward. And that's really critical. We don't have strong institutions that include Southeast Asia and South Asia. And I think that we need to, again, start to chart forward the kinds of trade rules, uh, the kinds of digital economic rules, um, the kind of uh, maritime rules that we're interested in promoting amongst like-minded countries. And right now what we're seeing is many of these trade rules and uh, maritime rules being tested. They're being tested in terms of the geopolitics of the region. But I think that there's real, a real sense that um, the first movers in trade, digital trade, or the first movers in AI will shape the rules of the road. And um, with that, it's really critical to be on the front line of shaping those rules so that we're locked in rather than locked out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see that Bert has a question, but just, just before that, on, on this topic of Indo-Pacific versus Asia-Pacific, you mentioned um, the APEC um, as a way to as a institu pre-existing institution to represent this broader region. Is this not sufficient um, in terms of uh, reinforcing rules and so on for the Indo-Pacific region? Um, as, Indo as you mentioned, some of the Indo-Pacific countries are, are already part of the APEC. So Sharon, that's a great question. And uh, as I mentioned, I do think that there is a real competition within the broader Indo-Pacific region in terms of shaping rules, uh, redefining how we understand international law, in particular in the maritime domain. And that competition mm -hmm. really is between um, China and um, like-minded countries that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put like-minded countries into the bucket of the United States, Canada, European countries, um, Southeast Asian countries, um, New Zealand, and many others. So there's a strong sense that um, the current rules of the road are being challenged in the maritime domain. And the implications is that we could see a shift in controlling uh, what we call sea lines of communication. So those are the important sea, line, uh, sea, uh, um, uh, ar uh, sea arteries that transport um, goods, imports and exports and energy resources through the East China Sea, the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea. Now for you as Canadians, and um, we do about 25.2 or $3 billion in trade through these sea lines of communication. Um, and it doesn't sound like much um, considering about one or $2 billion of trade across the US Canadian border every year, but only about 6% or 5% of Canada's GDP is really related to the Indo-Pacific region. So only six, five or 6% means that's a big chunk. $25.3 billion, and that will only increase. So um, I think that it's important for us to look at um, how some of the geopolitical competition in those sea lines of communication could affect uh, trade. Uh, my second point you know, has to do with this idea of new um, institutions to uh, develop the rules and the regulations of how we use AI, how we use um, cybersecurity, and what does this mean for um, Canadian businesses and other, uh, other countries' businesses in terms of using market forces to shape competition? And I think there's a growing concern that um, some countries uh, are going to create um, rules or regulations that um, favor state-owned enterprises, that favor an authoritarian system. And this could challenge or make um, the market uh, an unfair place for competition and trade. So I'll take, uh, let me take an attempt to, to wind in Bert's question with the follow-up here. You know, Canada's approach, you mentioned our lack uh, as a country, uh, especially federally, our lack of 
involvement with other institutions in the region. Several of the forums uh, that, that exist in Southeast Asia uh, and, and across the Pacific, for example. Our approach has been to go the bilateral route. The government's current strategy is to try and engage Indonesia, try and engage India, try and engage ASEAN, which is a hybrid, uh, the, the, the multilateral bilateral route. Um, is what we're talking about a break from that strategy? And how do other countries um, manage this? Intuitively, you think of places like New Zealand or the Aussies, they're part of the TPP. They're also part of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. They're at the table, they're part of these groups. So are you suggesting that we need a break from the bilateral? If that's the case, is the current bilateral strategy a bit of a problem for this approach? And what are our competitors doing that we should think about in terms of this bilateral, multilateral, regional approach? So I, I don't think it's a choice between bilateral and multilateral. I think that they are synergistic and they can, they can work with each other. So I, I really don't think that we should be thinking about replacing one with the other. Um, but I do think that there's some really, really uh, good examples of how Canada can better secure its role within the region. Uh, I'm going to use Japan as an example because I think it is uh, a really interesting country and it, it's kind of promiscuous. And, and why I use that word is that we see it join um, regional trade agreements like the TPP 11, which in, in many ways locks out China. And we'll probably come back to this when we talk about um, China and Taiwan in terms of potential candidates to join the TPP 11. But at the same time, um, Japan is part of the regional comprehensive economic partnership that includes China. So um, we see Japan working with China sometimes and without China. We also see Japan uh, engage in what we call multilateral uh, trade agreements. And some good examples of that is the Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement, which is a very comprehensive agreement that includes scientific exchanges, agricultural exchanges, uh, protection of intellectual property rights. And then we see Japan also layer um, an infrastructure connectivity agreement with the EU, again, to try and anchor it in the region and create these strong multilateral ties. And then at the same time, we see Japan, um, you know, actively uh, engaging in trilateral negotiations with South Korea and China for a trilateral FTA. So it's, again, it's working in various different forms to try and secure um, its economic interests within the region while anchoring um, other, um, uh, governments or multilateral organizations such as the EU into the Indo-Pacific region. And I think that that kind of approach is, uh, again, working in multilateral forms, trilateral forms, bilateral forms to secure um, Japanese interests in the region. And Canada, I think, um, could learn a lot from this experience. We've joined TPP 11. Um, my view is Canada should proactively uh, advocate for new members to the to the TPP 11, including the UK, potentially Taiwan, uh, potentially other actors, and uh, use these multilateral forms to anchor Canada into the region, create strong trading partners, and open up markets. But importantly, be part of the rulemaking process um, in the region. And something significant about the TPP. Uh, 11 is it focuses on intellectual property rights, it focuses on environmental law, it focuses on labor law, and limiting the role of state-owned enterprises. Why that's important? If you protect intellectual property rights, businesses will invest in research and development and the new technologies that are going to shape economies of the future. And that is really, really critical. And if Canada's part of that, um, I think that it's going to be part of shaping the rules and institutions of the future economy. And that's really critical to lock Canada's interests into the region rather than being locked up. Mm -hmm. It's interesting from our work here, uh, especially all the work that we did on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, modeling to make the case quantitatively uh, with data that Canada should be a part of the agreement. That work had to be done um, to push back against opposition in the country uh, for joining. There were real worries here, uh, unfounded, I would say completely unfounded, uh, about US retaliation. We have this internalized fear of it, you know, provoking the US that's not shared in Washington or any part of the US. 
Um, but yet it seemed to have kept us in this case from pursuing what were demonstrably our interests in, in, in strengthening these ties uh, with Indo, in Indo-Pacific. Is this something that you see or is this a partial explanation for why we lag so far behind uh, other countries, our competitors, our allies, in terms of engaging in the region? And if so, what can be done about this? So I think there's two things here, Carlo, is that we're, Canada's trade um, largely is centered in North America with, uh, within uh, NAFTA 2.0. And um, this creates a, a critical mass of businesses that are oriented towards North America. We also have our traditional Atlantic-centered relationship and the Indo-Pacific, or as you call it, the Pacific Rim or the Asia Pacific, seems to be an afterthought. Um, it, it's an afterthought in terms of engagement and in terms of um, finding those clear opportunities within the region. So my view is that um, the North American trade relationship will always be the, the primary relationship within, our, uh, within Canada's uh, sphere of influence because of proximity, because of shared rules, because of NAFTA 2.0. Um, and the Atlantic Center will continue to be in, uh, important, but if we're thinking about five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and we're thinking about China, India, Southeast Asia, um, they will have burgeoning middle classes, and there'll be middle class consumers that will want to buy Canadian products. And with that, if we want to maintain um, a prosperous Canada, we want to... Um, slightly diversify our trading relationships so we're less sensitive to some of the shocks that do come from our southern neighbors, then investing in the region is really, really critical. And as your trade figures, as, as your quantitative data shows, Canada clearly benefits from engagement within the region. Now, the question for Canadians, and Western, uh, Western Canadians, is where are those market areas that they can um, fill the niche? Um, what are the networks they need to uh, work with and how can they do this? Um, fortunately, and I think this is really interesting that we have now established what we call a joint chamber of commerce of the Indo-Pacific where um, Canadian businesses throughout the region are starting to share their practices and their questions and the opportunities that exist, but also challenges. And I think that's a really good um, start in terms of thinking about how we can foster more collaboration through the region through sharing best practices. Um, and um, I think this is a really good start for Canada. And that, um, yeah, for many of the people on the call today, if you're interested in this, I do encourage you to take a look at um, the Joint Chamber of Commerce of the Indo-Pacific that has been initiated not by government, but, but by businesses who see this as an important um, initiative to better penetrate um, the Indo-Pacific region and benefit from the economic opportunities there. Turn it over to Sharon in just a sec, but uh, you know we'll uh, try and post information on that uh, to go out with this uh, with this with this broadcast. So some way, shape, or form, we'll stick a link or something there to to information about this. Um, so Sharon. Well, I just thought um, Eddie Wong's question, just um, as a continuation on the discussion on institutions. I thought he had a good question. Given the trend toward regionalism and the tensions between China and the West, should such an initiative for institution building come from an Asian country or a Western country like Canada? Uh, so thanks, Eddie. Good question. Um, so I am I'm I'm not an advocate of Canada spearheading this initiative. I'm, I'm an advocate of Canada working with um, partners within the region, finding out what they want from Canada, finding out what they need um, and you know, looking for um, shared interests within the region. Um, my view is that um, building strong, transparent institutions that are based on rule of law will be critical to sustainable economic development moving forward, to promoting trade, uh, to promoting um, a, a shared understanding of how, to, of how countries should engage, not only in trade, and, uh, but also in the security realm. And I think that really is the driving, that should be the driving force. Um, what we've seen is a shift over the past five or six years, where I think um, six or seven years ago, uh, Northeast countries like Japan 
um, and the United States were primarily thinking about security. And security does remain a, a critical area of interest within the region, but there's been a shift, uh, a shift to thinking about what are the interests of Southeast Asia and South Asia? Um, what are their priorities? And when you listen to their priorities, their priorities are development, uh, infrastructure connectivity, uh, trade, and um, prosperity through an inclusive development process. And here, I think many of those um, interests uh, overlap with Canada, and it provides a platform for cooperation of Canada with um, partners within the region to help the region develop and again, create those strong in institutions that can deal with the challenges in the region uh, and promote uh, trade. Uh, and, and prosperity. And I think that is a, a shared goal of all the countries uh, in the region uh, and a good place to start for, for Canada working with partners um, in the broader Indo-Pacific, including China. Do you think we have the capacity to do this? You mentioned you know, the inordinate amount of resources we have to spend keeping an eye and keeping tabs on the Americans. Uh, the, our, our focus historically across the Atlantic and, you know, the previous previous government, the America strategy, where I did a lot of work. Do you think we have the resources, the human capital, the capacity to do everything you suggested or even most of what you suggested with the Indo-Pacific? I, I think that Canada needs to invest in the resources and into the human capital um, to uh, train young people so they have a broader understanding of the region. My, I guess my impression is that we've created a lot of China specialists that don't understand the rest of the region. Um, and that's a problem because China is not the region. China is part of the region. Um, we need to develop and continue to invest in our long-term partnerships like Japan, Korea, uh, Singapore. These are long-standing uh, uh, long relationships with, like, with very similar views about um, government, about regulation, about how institutions should develop. So we do need to invest more. Um, the question is, uh, where should we start? Uh, I think that it's really critical to start with like-minded partners within the region and based on those partnerships, um, slowly and incrementally start to build the capacities through cooperation in bilateral and multilateral forms um, to secure Canadian interests within the region. Um, lastly, and I think really, really importantly, when we're thinking about um, the Indo-Pacific region, it's vast. And I think this is where we need to work more synergistically with the business community, as well as our um, uh, various um, uh, immigrant communities that can use their um, ethnic background and their familial background to um, engage in the region. And that's really, really critical is to mobilize our citizens so that we can leverage their talents and their skills and their networks so that they can benefit Canada. And I think we need to do much more of that. Yeah, two assets that I think we, we, we do leave on the table, the diaspora populations we have. So those with deep ties to the region, not just uh, professed affinity, but affinity and knowledge that's based on interaction, that's based on agency, that's based on real connections. The other you know, the private sector is one of our leading groups in terms of going to these regions. So I think a couple of years back, I was just down in Lethbridge County, briefing the county commissioners who were on a trip to getting ready to head off to a trip to China and Japan. So one of the things I think we don't do is share that knowledge. The other issue we have is, you know, I had to write an op-ed in the Lethbridge Herald defending the county commissioners for going off to one of their biggest markets, a market that had made four or five visits to Lethbridge, but for which Lethbridge hadn't returned the favor. So we have this asset, but we keep tripping over ourselves in the expenditure of resources to follow trade, which is you know, hugely important. The numbers bear out how important it is, that's always been an issue. And that's something I don't think we've ever really come to terms with. I would, before turning it back to Sharon, I would also just note on China, you know, uh, I'm glad you think we, we've got that generation of sinologists, those who study China coming along. I still see just huge, huge gaps. We talk about the five-year plan here and outside of, you know, Finance Canada and Foreign Affairs, 
most Canadians know that it's a plan and that it's five years for a second largest trading partner, 13% of agricultural trade. That sort of the gap that we have is just, it's as scary as anything that we see coming out of China. Our lack of knowledge, our lack of ability to understand what's happening. China, the, the whole region is just really, really frightening. Well, as someone that lives in the region and you know, I was just in Ottawa last week um, speaking to various uh, interest groups, uh, I do think that policymakers get it. But yes, there is not enough expertise that understands uh, the region. Um, and I think that needs to be bolstered. Uh, we need stronger programs. We need people that understand the languages in the region. We need people that understand the cultures. And again, I, as I mentioned, I don't think it's enough to be a single country. Uh, so for myself, I don't just focus on Japan, although I live in Japan, I focus on the region and the interactions between the region. And I think that gives me a, a kind of insight into, again, as I mentioned, the China paradox. Um, you know, from afar, I think people look at Japan's um, initiatives in the region and they see uh, a harder line against uh, China or perhaps a more engaged policy towards Taiwan. But when you drill into the data and you start to think about the trade relationship and you speak to uh, people in the region, it's different. You know, the Japanese are not taking this zero sum approach to China. They're engaging where they can. And they're building other relationships where they where they think is necessary to pull China in a different direction, and I think that we need more um, regional specialists that understand the region in general. Um, I don't think we have enough, Carlo. So if I if I gave that impression, uh, I apologize. I think we need much much more um, talent that understands um, the region, and I really think it's important to start from our our, our traditional uh, long standing like minded partners. So I think I, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon next. I, I think we just got David Hill's question there with what can agriculture do? Sharing the, the experience when visits are made, you know, I shouldn't be the one writing the, the piece in the left for Cheryl. It should be the groups that have gone to, to share the information and, and, and to talk about it when they come back. Um, yeah, we'll turn it over to back over to Sharon. She had a, she had a thought here. Yeah, uh, no, I just wanted to say thanks to Stephen for really emphasizing uh, Japan's role in terms of this interplay between politics and trade and also policy in the region. I think that's really important and um, not really thought of uh, often or enough here um, in Western Canada or even in Canada. Um, I think um, Zanbaz had a really good question um, who said, unlike Japanese, which doesn't follow the zero-sum game, is the Canadian interest lined with the U.S. interest exclusively in South Asia and Southeast Asia? There is a apprehension in countries of South Asia and Southeast Asia that Canada won't invest, or even if it invests, it would be heavily influenced by U.S. policy in respect of China. So uh, Yam, Yambaz, that's a great question. And I think I've argued this in many of my writing publicly and privately is that Canada needs its own brand. Uh, it needs to be seen as an honest stakeholder within the region that will disagree with um, its US partner uh, on a principled way when they feel it's necessary. Um, but I think at the same time, we should be realistic that Canada and, and the United States share many values, many interests. And we will likely be aligned many of, of, of the days of the week because of that shared background and shared uh, trade interest within the region. Um, for Canada engaging with Southeast Asia and, and South Asia, the criticism I usually hear is it's not sustained, uh, it's not serious, and we really don't, know, they, um, Southeast and Southeast Asians feel that Canada is not, um, it's not taking the region seriously. Um, and with that, I think Canada does have some, uh, a long ways to go to build a better presence. And one way to do that, again, is to set up a permanent presence, a presence within the region, a trade office that's specifically focusing on trade in Southeast Asia. Um, it could be uh, setting up a permanent presence in terms of um, an a, a, a institution that focuses on health or uh, infrastructure and connectivity, but it's about that sustained engagement with stakeholders within the region uh, and showing face 
and finding out what uh, are the uh, needs and interests of partners within the region and what they want of Canada. Um, and I think that is really, really critical. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think that it's really critical that Canada does build its own brand, um, a principle-based brand that does um, sit apart from the United States, but also is also true, you know, true to the reality that um, Canada and the United States share many, many interests in the region. Super question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like that one as well. So just very quickly to follow up on that, you know, this issue about building capacity is something with which we struggle. When those of us um, in think tanks and research institutions talk about building capacity, when Sharon and I go to the parliament and raise this point, you get the eye rolls. It's pinheads asking for more money for more pinheads uh, to, to run around and write papers. So uh, I think as a self-criticism for us, we really have to do a better job of making the case as to why this is important. I would argue that's because we haven't succeeded. Uh, we haven't gotten through. So that's a criticism directed you know, back, at, back, back at us and our failure. We're, we've been aware of this, but we just haven't been able to make the case um, in a way that really moves people to, 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 to think about it, to get the resources that we need, resources that are focused on interest, as a national interest, as opposed to academic interest, I would argue is, is a key change that we can start to make um, when, when, when we talk about this. But let's, uh, let's go on to other questions. Um, yeah, so Michael Goldberg just sent a question um, asking briefly, how do we leverage the regional diasporas in Canada, their ties back to the Indo-Pacific and the numerous business associations built around these diasporas and their business interests, ties and opportunities? So Michael, that's a great question. And I think that this is a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, I think for many of our, 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 let's say ethnic Hungarian communities or ethnic Chinese communities or ethnic Korean communities, um, they may not want to actually be that a bridge to um, wherever their national heritage comes from uh, because of political differences, because of some of the challenges um, it, with some of the countries within the region, there's inherent risk in doing that. Um, so I think that we need to be sensitive to those challenges. But at the same time, I think that um, if a, an ethnic uh, community um, does form a chamber of commerce, for example, of let's say uh, in, in, in Calgary that focuses on trade, um, let's say in Southeast Asia, then we need to find opportunities to share and promote and, and support that initiative. Um, so I think we have to be sensitive to um, the, the politics that can create real pressure on our ethnic communities. But at the same time, if it's an organic um, uh, organization, where let's say Southeast Asians come together to promote more uh, Canada presence in Southeast Asia, then we should find ways to, to help them. Um, and it could be providing a bit of research through um, you know, think tanks like Canada West Foundation, looking at Canada's um, trade footprint in Southeast Asia. What can we do better? What can we do, what do we need to improve? Um, it could be um, public forums to pro provide more insight in terms of what are the opportunities in the region or events like this where um, somebody that uh, understands the region quite well comes and speaks to uh, business leaders or to the um, different ethnic communities in our country uh, of what they could be doing to um, secure uh, economic opportunity within the region. Yeah, that's a, that, that is a great question. It's also one that requires a podcast of, of its own. But we did quite a bit of work on this issue, how to work with diaspora populations for development and trade back when I was with the U.S. government. Um, and you know, the, the discussions and the experience, obviously the U.S. political environment um, and the immigration environment is a bit different. But the issues that Stephen outlined were front of mind with us as we were working through these issues. You know, the conditions of exit determine diaspora views in, in, in their new country. And those conditions of exit, how they left the country, good terms, bad terms, um, can really shape 
uh, their approach to, to, to their country of origin. And those conditions of exit don't always line up with national interest in the new country. So on the political side, there's much, much um, attention and caution um, that needs to be exercised. But economically, and especially for international development, we found great allies in terms of making development investments in these communities, in terms of improving the conditions of entry for people into the US by working with diaspora populations. So when we think about trade in a place like Hong Kong, say, where you're looking to attract people that are leaving, the diaspora population in country can play a huge role in making you more competitive for attracting talent. So it's really useful to think about the opportunities and specificity. Look at specific opportunities. A blanket policy that takes consideration of the political and economic, yes, but conditions change diaspora group to diaspora group, even within diaspora groups, and they change about the specifics of what's being discussed. But that is a whole nother level of investment in terms of developing capacity to think about this that um, we've done some of that in Canada, but um, that's an area where, again, more, 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 more research and more investment uh, is needed to develop the capacity to manage it with sophistication, with nuance and with caution. So. Um, so I noticed that there are some questions as well in the Q uh, question and answer box that we've received, um, still concerning you know, the more macro institutional level. So um, Chen Yi Wang uh, asked, you mentioned that transparency is very important for building robust international trade system. Do you think China would be willing to adapt itself to these rules or try to model the, uh, the world with its own rules given its heavy way in international trade? Um, I think that's a really good question because that's something that I've been discussing over the last two weeks. Uh, since the WTO's trade policy review on China, but I'll let you answer it first, Stephen. So I, I think um, if, if you want to know what China thinks, you should read what Chinese authors are, are writing. And there's uh, quite a prominent scholar that I recommend you Google up, uh, Yang Shui Tong. And maybe um, Sharon, you can just put that name in the uh, text box from Tsinghua University. And he's pretty explicit. Um, he says, you know, China will work hard to, um, to weaken the influence of the United States and Western institutions um, so that they um, better reflect um, the needs and the interests of uh, the Chinese government. Um, he's written it quite explicitly. We have other prominent scholars that also write about this. Uh, and I think um, the Chinese government also is very clear about this, is that um, they feel that current international institutions favor Western concepts of governance, um, it, uh, over focus on transparency and rule of law, and um, potentially uh, questions about sovereignty and non-interference. And uh, the current government in China would very much like to weaken all of these uh, initiatives. And I think that also includes in the trade um, environment. So I think um, you should ask Chinese um, scholars about this and Chinese policy makers about this. And I think they've been unequivocally clear. Um, I think that when we look at examples such as the BRI and the um, export of the digital economy to BRI recipients, that's the Belt Road Initiative, we see that um, the Chinese government is also exporting its standards um, in terms of how to um, negotiate and, and use the digital economy. Uh, and I think that is really, really important for you to be thinking about. It means that these countries are being locked into uh, Chinese standards um, that really focus on sovereignty, non-interference, uh, less transparent approach to uh, bilateral relations, non-binding approaches to bilateral relations. And I think ultimately this creates challenges in terms of sustained uh, uh, rules-based, transparent, uh, good governance that really provides the real foundation for long-term sustained growth. So we'll get to Dave and we'll put you in touch with Dave and Wally directly. We've got a couple of good friends of Canada West set of questions. I wanted to turn back to your conundrum of China and thinking about your approach to allies, 
and working within like-minded countries in the region. There is another contradiction or conundrum. Our allies also tend to be our competitors. So when we can cooperate with folks, like with the Americans, we will cooperate with the Americans on security matters. We will cooperate with the Americans on intelligence matters. We will cooperate with the Americans on political matters. But when it comes to economics and trade, we often find ourselves in competition with the Americans, the Australians, uh, the Americans, as you know, we famously talk about with the NAFTA renegotiation, told us, don't you dare talk to China. Meanwhile, what were they doing? Talking to China to sign an agreement behind our back that basically stabbed Canadian farmers in the back and put a hand in Canadian farmers' wallets. Um, so we find that even with our allies, we face this economic competition. Um, how do we manage this? You know, I'm writing a book chapter on this one that you're going to read and critique. Um, but um, share some thoughts, because you, you and I go back and forth about this, but some of your thoughts. Our interests do not always line up with our political allies' interests. Our political allies, especially the Americans, will run through us in the New York second if there's money on the table. If we do extradition favors or other things for the Americans, it's not going to show up in economic considerations if there's money on the table. So how do we manage the, the, this tension? So um, Carlo, that's a, a great question. And uh, in most of my writings, I write a lot about middle powers and um, middle powers such as Canada and the need to, um, of course, shape China's behavior in a more positive direction but also shape the United States behavior in a more positive direction. And the previous administration um, was a challenging one in terms of um, not only optics, but the style that it engaged in renegotiation um, uh, activities. And I think the NAFTA 2.0 agreement was very much um, uh, an example of that, um, I guess, coercive behavior um, that we experienced from our ally. Uh, so I, I think that it's really critical that uh, Canada works with middle powers to try and shape the behavior of um, our allies like the United States so that we don't fall um, victim to the kind of coercion that I think that we saw in the previous administration. Uh, and, and I think that is a really a big take home. And um, often when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, um, we think about it in terms of the United States and China shaping the region. But in reality, I think that it will be a, a collection of middle powers that are going to come together to um, influence uh, both China and the United States in terms of how there are their competition and the choices that they're making are not really in line with uh, long-term allies or stakeholders in the region. Um, and, and from this point of view, I think that of course, Canada will have to work um, with the United States. Um, it will continue to be challenged by that relationship in some areas. Um, but as long as it's market forces driving the interaction, I think that um, Canada or Australia or other countries will be able to manage that. But if it's sta the state um, per se that's shaping the rules of the road, I think this is, is much more problematic for Canadian interests and the interests of other middle powers. Um, and I think that what we saw in the previous administration, um, it wasn't market forces that were driving the NAFTA 2.0, it was a, a political process. And I think um, growing challenges emerging from China is not market forces driving the problems in the economic relationship, but politics. Um, and it's something interesting. And I see Sharon with her hand up. Sure. Yeah, um, just on that note, given what you just said, would reinforcing the WTO not be more beneficial in terms of, um, you know, as a middle power stance on, on addressing some of the issues, whether it is transparency or IP or digitization or otherwise? My sense is that the WTO is uh, not going to be able to deal with these challenges. Um, there's too many um, stakeholders that have too much to say, and what will eventually happen is the, the lowest common denominator will be the basis for any kind of reform in the WTO. Uh, my sense is um, there's a collection of, of like-minded countries that would like to either reform the WTO entirely or um, use um, templates such as the TPP-11 or uh, TPP-2.0 
as uh, a new template for how we think about trade, how we think about IPR, how we think about environmental law, labor law, and the role of state or enterprises amongst a whole other group of chapters. Um, I think that uh, that is the direction. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a, a very optimistic view about the future of the WTO um, because of mm -hmm. the enormous challenges I think it's facing. Although, but that being said, um, my concern is I would see a proliferation of these regionalism or regional institutions and then and then that creates conflicts as well within each other in this within this like spaghetti bowl effect of, of institutions. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to stand by my point. I think that the competition moving forward is going to push from both the United States and China to uh, move away from, I think, um, large multilateral trade agreements that uh, limit the choices they have in terms of their bilateral competition. And this is going to create enormous pressures on Canada, Australia, and other um, middle powers or smaller countries. And um, I think the outcome will likely be some kind of renegotiated um, smaller version of the TPP that creates a critical mass of countries that moves forward um, and um, really creates uh, that kind of uh, uh, critical mass of, of like-minded countries that, that feel that the, the trade rules that exist between them are market-oriented and, and meet their national interests. So this kind of, we're, we're getting close to the end. I want to let Sharon ponder the last question uh, to bring to Stephen after this one. You know, it, it seems that we are, the, your, your prediction for middle powers to band together to try and constrain or direct or nudge the action of the, the, the two global economic hegemons appears to be happening with the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Agreement, one could argue. You know, it's had many purposes in its long history from Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand. But one was the thought with the Obama administration that this could contain China. Um, but when Donald Trump came along, the idea suddenly emerged, well, <laughs> maybe it's more important to contain the Trump administration, to have a group of countries that would have a set of rules that could give some counter to the power of, of, of the Trump administration. So with the prospect, with Donald Trump not having gone away, and my recent trip to Washington convinced me that his return is very much on, on the table. And with China asking to join the TPP, does your idea for these agreements to nuance or change the behavior of these larger powers suddenly start to bear out on the ground? If China were to join the TPP and join by accepting most of the conditions in a way that supported what's there, would this be one step toward what you're talking about? And would this be good for Canada? Lots to unpack there. So um, my view is what we'll likely see is um, Japan and other countries will uh, pull out the negotiations for both Taiwan and uh, China to uh, join the TPP as long as possible. And this may be used as pressure to pull back the United States uh, to the TPP-11 or to encourage the United States to uh, lead a, a TPP 2.0 that um, has middle class, um, the middle class as one of its key components. Um, I think many of the current TPP members would welcome that um, because I think that their fundamental interest is to anchor the United States within the region. And they would like to anchor the United States through trade through uh, building shared norms about how trade should be and through uh, trade formation. Um, whether Japan and other countries will do that, that's a really interesting question, but I, I foresee this as being the uh, way forward. Um, and I do think uh, countries like Canada would probably welcome that kind of initiative because again, the purpose is to get the United States into the region to be part of the trading environment. And it's interesting, the United States is not part of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's not part of the TPP-11. And if a trilateral free trade agreement went with China, South Korea, and Japan, that would be the third um, huge trade agreement that the United States is not part of. 
and I'm not even counting the Japan e, uh, EU EPA. Um, these are significant uh, downward pressures on the US economy. And I think there's uh, enormous value in uh, the United States being part of the region in terms of trade. But that goes back to one of your very, your, your points today is the data says trade is good. The data says Canada should be in the region. And I would say the data says the United States should be part of the region. There's a lot of opportunity there, but the public's not there. They misunderstand the region. They don't understand the importance of trade within the region. Um, and I think that is uh, a place where we need to speak more loudly and be part of the process of informing the public of why trade is important, the benefits of trade in the region, and how does that trade um, really um, percolate down to um, the agricultural community, the uh, beef, poultry, and pork community, uh, our community that exports natural resources. Um, we need to have, be much more um, loud and informed and convincing uh, to ensure that our publics understand the importance of trade. Yeah, this is largely in the current environment, a, a thankless task. We've had the rise of what you know, I've termed neo-McCarthyism, referring to the, the, the McCarthy hearings um, and the Red Scare in the US. We've had a rise of that in, in, in Canada. There are obvious threats but over-responding or misunderstanding the threats poses as great a danger to us as the threats themselves. McCarthyism was a huge, did huge damage to the US, to its reputation, to its ability to respond to the rise of communism. It's so, you know, misunderstanding the threats, mischaracterizing them for short-term political gain um, is just as dangerous. So, yeah, it's 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 a job that's not without. It, it's yeah, you know this as well. Even over in Japan, it's a tough position to be making these arguments based on data, based on reason, um, in the current political environment, especially as it bleeds over from the U.S. Well, I'm glad we've had uh, almost a hundred people on the call today listening to these kinds of ideas, and hopefully they go back and. Um, they share those Halloween treats with their family members and share some of the ideas uh, and it will spread. But again, I think more rational discussions um, with people that are interested in these issues is really critical to building uh, more literate Indo-Pacific stakeholders. And that includes <laughs> Indo-Pacific stakeholders um, from Western Canada um, and um, in the uh, Canada West Foundation. Well, thanks, so let's give the next generation of great trade economists and great thinkers on trade, the, uh, the, the final question, the final thought for the day. Um, well, actually, I was going to say we still have quite um, a few questions, big questions from climate change policy impact of trade to that region to, you know, what does the post-COVID environment look like for Canadian trade with the region? Um, but I think given the time, um, we would be happy to, you know, email these questions to you, Stephen. And I have can... 10 more minutes if you'd like. Oh, okay. So, well, I don't know which one you would like to choose. Uh, the climate You're the change. Boss. Or... You're the boss, Sharon. Um, sure. Well, I think the climate change question is, you know, a really big elephant in the room. So we should definitely um, uh, at least talk a little bit about that. So uh, a question from Brittany Hunter. What impact do you think the climate change policy will have on trading with this region? Uh, thanks, Brittany. So uh, I think when we're speaking about climate change, I think we should be, um, I, I don't know how many of you on the call understand or know that China, Japan, and Korea, the biggest economies within the region, have committed to uh, a zero carbon future by 2050 and 2060. Um, they're investing heavily in renewables, solar, uh, wind, um, biomatter, and uh, nuclear. And I think that this is a real sign that the future going forward in terms of climate change is about really changing our energy profile. And these countries are leading it. And, um, you know, uh, because I spend so much time in the region, um, you know, places like China have substantially improved their environmental uh, uh, footprint. Um, and you can notice it. Um, so when we're thinking about climate change and we're thinking about opportunities for Canada, um, I think that we need to be thinking about how climate change is going to positively and negatively impact the region. Uh, in terms of 
positive impact. Um, you know, we might see um, northern parts of China become a little bit more hospitable in terms of agriculture. Um, but the reality, the hotter it gets, it's going to be more severe water shortages and problems in terms of uh, producing um, the huge amounts of, of food that will be necessary to um, manage a population of 1.4 billion people. In that sense, I think that um, Canada will have a huge role in terms of dealing with some of the food security challenges that China faces. And it's really critical that Canadian um, you know, agricultural leaders are already building those relationships, uh, creating those pipelines where that they can um, eventually um, provide for the needs of a country that will be challenged in terms of food security. Um, Southeast Asia and South Asia similarly will be affected negatively by climate change. I don't think it's, um, it can be prevented. And that means that um, we're going to, they're also going to have food security challenges and it will be Canada and, and the United States that largely um, fills the gap in terms of the food security challenges moving forward. So this is bad news. Uh, for their, that region, but it's an opportunity for Canada and I think the United States in terms of thinking about um, where the future markets lie, not just because of the enormous amount of middle class consumers that are going to merge, but thinking about how climate change is really going to create food security challenges for these regions and that they're going to need um, steady and sustainable suppliers. And I think Canada can fill that role. Yeah, and I, and I also want to add, you know, given the recent events from, um, you know, like increasingly high coal prices and other energy prices, it really emphasizes the increasing challenge in the region in terms of looking for substitutes um, in order to also meet the, meet the goals that these individual countries have, have indicated in, um, uh, in Paris, in COP. Um, but at the same time, you know, be able to, to uh, continue its economic growth um, and facilitate this economic growth. So that's an increasingly challenging problem in the region, in China, um, as well as, you know, the Indo-Pacific region. And I, so I think Canada does have a role to play uh, in that. Carlo, back to you. I was going to let you continue with the questions and uh, take it out from here. Uh, no, I think that's about it. Uh, the only other question that I see is- We have Dave, the, and, Dave and Wally. We can actually bring them in rather than just emailing them off to the side. Yeah, so David earlier asked a question, what role should various sectors such as agriculture, food and nutrition play in developing these new relationships? Was that the one? Oh, yep. no, wait, that, that was- I think that was answered. There was a question about COVID. And supply chains. Yeah, let me just, oh yes. Uh, what discussion of re repatriating supply chain post COVID does what we trade look different in the future? Is that of concern to the Asia Pacific region? So thanks, David. That's a really important question. And, uh, and when Carla and Sharon and I were kind of thinking about the theme of this discussion, we were going to talk about selective or um, a selective diversification of supply chains. And what that really means is that I think on um, sensitive technologies that we're going to see firewalls being built in terms of sensitive technologies that really are associated with semiconductors and dual use um, products. Um, I think increasingly we're going to see supply chains try to deal with some of the resilience challenges that we've had in the region. And um, just let me illustrate. So um, when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, started in Wuhan, um, what we saw, the Chinese government shut down that whole region. And that whole region really is a center of, of manufacturing for cars and for pharmaceutical products. And the lesson was, and, and of course it, it created challenges in terms of the supply chains for these products globally. And I think the lesson from that is that um, within China, there's an it's really important to start to diversify supply chains and to make them more resilient in the case that there's another um, shutdown in parts of the uh, Chinese uh, supply chain. But there's also this understanding that uh, supply chains need to diversify throughout the region 
to create more resilience and more, more alternatives to deal with black, black swan events such as um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, natural, uh, um, uh, natural disasters such as the March uh, 2011 uh, tsunami and earthquake in Japan, and that by creating more resilience and selectively diversifying, that we can ensure that um, supply chains remain open and they remain uh, sustainable and relatively steady. And I think that is the broader trend that we're seeing right now. So it's partly driven by cost, it's partly driven by geopolitics, and it's partly driven by the reality that another COVID pandemic will happen, another transnational issue will happen, another um, a natural disaster will happen that will disrupt supply chains. And it's really critical that we create uh, a whole bunch of uh, alternatives so this is not a decoupling argument. Um, I think decoupling is not possible. Rather, it's selectively trying to um, diversify on sensitive technologies, but also creating resilience throughout the system. Um, so you know, the, the decoupling argument you know, shows up in a couple places, especially with supply and production chains. One of the more insidious um, threats we face is you know the China is the, the the largest economy, supply and production chains, its dominant market position in key industrial inputs, in manufacturing inputs, and increasingly in um, in digital inputs. We may not want to decouple, but when the Americans come along and tell us to decouple. Um, we could very easily wind up in the spot where the Americans don't have the same exposure to these supply chains because of the size of their economy that we do. And we find ourselves back in the 1950s uh, when the Americans were coming after us to try and decouple, uh, not to sell grain to China. Um, they were coming after firms, US subsidiary firms in Canada. They were coming after Canadian firms that were trading uh, in third party countries. So, you know, thinking about this going forward, that's something we're trying to wrap our minds around here. The exposure to extraterritorial measures that the Americans enact in their economic conflict with China and their attempt to move those US economic measures to third parties. And given our integration with the US and our increasing integration with Chinese supply and production chains, we could find ourselves drawn up short. And this is Huawei, not with 5G, but Huawei with 4G. And the needs that we have, First Nations communities, 60% of whom aren't wired um, to, to, to adequate measure in this country, who don't, have, um, who don't have the access and for whom a company like Huawei that produces 4G technology that's appropriate for remote and difficult installations, a company that makes its money in Africa, not in easy markets, may be an important consideration here. So going forward, those supply and production chains face, uh, I think, a more insidious threat, and that's the exportation of the American uh, con economic conflict with China through extraterritorial measures. And we've seen this in the 1950s with Ethan Baker. We've seen this in the 80s um, with Cuba and Helms Burton. Um, and we've seen it uh, more recently from the Americans as well. Just a, just a thought. Yeah, I, and I would agree with the concerns about this in certain, certain supply chains that are really sensitive in terms of the geopolitical competition between the two countries. Um, but, and, I, and I'll just, um, you know, we're all online today and I, I would wager that most of us bought things to work from home over the past year and a half, uh, whether it's a chair or a new computer or a new monitor and I think if you look at the label, most of that stuff came from China. And um, my, my point is, is that um, our trade relationship um, is robust. Um, we consume many products that are produced uh, in that part of the world. And if the United States was to somehow think about decoupling, that they would have to replace all of those products that are made extremely cheaply uh, and they can be consumed um, in the United States. Um, and the challenge there is that we don't see the United States um, really fundamentally changing its economy so that um, people can afford 
um, more expensive things that are made at home or even made in, across the border in Canada. And until that equation changes, um, I think that the supply chains that are primarily um, in China uh, will continue to supply the consumer goods for uh, the middle classes um, in North America, in Europe, in Japan, and many other parts of the world. Hmm. The, the only positive to this is that we can identify areas where we are vulnerable, if things for which the Americans are not concerned about with their trade with China, but which we are because we don't have the size and the, the breadth of the American economy. Yeah. So we can in the future start to identify those areas where we may get blindsided by the Americans asking us to do something that's in their interest that they can afford, but is a bit, uh, but the same calculation doesn't apply to us. And that's where I think we've got to learn the lessons from history from the 1950s. Um, and earlier in terms of starting to think proactively about that and define our interest in advance of the Americans telling, defining our interest for us. As you mentioned, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So we certainly need to be in the table in that discussion. Absolutely. That requires hey. understand the region, understand the trends, and uh, can ha have a voice in the policy discussions here in Canada. So we're already 13 minutes over, but quickly, tell us what, we're, what you're up to, what we should be looking for in our inboxes or your next uh, research line publications so that people who want to follow you know what to look for. All right. Well, I, I just finished a, a six-part uh, six policy brief with the McDonald laurier Institute about Canada's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, focusing on trade, the digital economy, and the maritime environment, uh, and a few other themes, which you can access at the McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, I'm just finishing a book on Chinese perceptions of Japanese foreign policy under Prime Minister Abe, which basically contrasts and compares how they understood um, the former Prime Minister's policies uh, when he was working with Mr. Obama and his policies when he was working with Mr. Trump. And I guess the, the take home is that the Chinese are very, um, adept at reading the power changes um, in Tokyo, and that um, they're really not wedded to any particular view about Japan. Um, they're wedded to their national interests. Um, and uh, lastly, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing up a couple of books on, or a couple of articles on um, middle powers and how they can uh, be uh, proactive stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific in terms of shaping institutions and uh, pushing the behavior of uh, the great powers in more positive directions. Yeah, that's, that's why we love you so much. Uh, one, one, one of many reasons, that's a really impressive research agenda and we look forward to sharing it with you in the future. I'm just gonna prepare an invoice to send off to Brian Lee Crowley for that plug for McDonald Laurier. Uh, he's going to get, see, see how much I can hit him up for for that. With that, <laughs> Sharon, anything? Uh, to take us out? No, I'm, I'm good. I think you should close up now because we are running quite late into the time. There you go. We still have 65 people on, which is a real sign for interest in this topic. Stephen, it's always a pleasure to have you out for dinner when you're back home here in Calgary. Um, and it's even better seeing you in Japan where you've got the, the in on some of the best places to go out and get sushi. I look forward to doing that in the future again as well. Thanks to um, Canada West Foundation, Carlo, Sharon, and, and your team for an amazing event and all the people on the, on the call that ask great questions. Um, I learn as much from all of you as, as hopefully you learned from today's discussion. So thanks. Thanks. And uh, for those listening, uh, tomorrow, Gary Marr, our CEO, is going to be talking with the new Council General for the uh, UK here in, uh, in the prairies. So if you have a chance, tune in for that. Otherwise, uh, from Canada West, we'll have our infrastructure paper out, how to reform Canada's trade infrastructure. Uh, that's been several years in the making and that will be out soon. And Sharon and I are just wrapping up our early analysis of the China's five-year plan and how we should start formulating our ability to understand that and over the long term be able to work with it and use the information in it. That'll be coming out very shortly. So Stephen, again, always a pleasure to see you. Um, Sharon, thanks for joining. Tokyo or Beijing or Calgary or wherever we see each other next. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Look forward to it. Sounds and good. dinner. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. And to okay. everyone joining us, thank you, thank you for joining.